And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Alan Mason, who is my colleague and uh, board member from the League of American Orchestras and also managing director for BlackRock's EII business. Alan has graciously put together this session for us and will be leading the discussion. So thank you very much, Alan, and over to you. Great. So uh, what an inspiring three days we've had. And I hope that we can, in this session, have a really open and honest conversation about it, what it takes to move forward together around EDI uh, from a leadership point of view. Um, so today I am, and I will moderate and participate in this because we want to share insights from the corporate sector around EDI and leadership, what works, what doesn't work, and we want to have a really honest conversation with you about that. We're not making the case for EDI by your presence at this session, you've already indicated that you want EDI to move forward. So we're here to share what we've learned trying to make it happen in the corporate world with you and then interact with you around the questions that matter to you. So I am, um, so just, a, you heard that I'm on the league board, but just a little bit about me. Uh, the first half of my life was all about music, playing the oboe, studying music, ethnomusicology. And then in 1991, I sort of accidentally ended up with a two-day temp job in an investment firm. And 30 years later, I'm still working with uh, in investments. And I have uh, most recently run the index investments business for BlackRock. Um, and I'm, I'm still a BlackRock executive. Um, on the EDI front at BlackRock, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that I founded the LGBT network at BlackRock and uh, it has grown and influenced a lot of things within BlackRock and beyond. So that's something I'm very proud of from a, from a corporate EDI point of view. T uh, so today I'm joined by Jonathan McBride and Anna Mock. I'll start with Jonathan. Uh, first of all, Jonathan, they're both good friends, but Jonathan is a partner at Hydric and Struggles in the uh, LA office. He's a leader in their DEI practice. Uh, he's an advisor to boards, CEOs, he works on things like leadership, culture, diversity, equity, belonging, those kinds of topics. He, had an, he founded an advisory firm after BlackRock. He was the head of diversity at BlackRock. We worked together for a number of years when he was doing that. And uh, before that, he was the director of uh, the presidential personnel office uh, under the Obama administration in 2009. So uh, uh, welcome to Jonathan. Thank you. And please join me in talking to Jonathan. Thank you. And then um, uh, Anna Mock is a partner at Deloitte, uh, the Asia Pacific leader, uh, and works in its advisory businesses. Notably for this, she's the co-founder of Ascend, which is a network to advance the careers of Pan-Asian business professionals. Uh, Anna and I also met through various sort of corporate network activities when she was trying to expand uh, Asian American networks within the financial services area and was trying to get our firm to join with them to expand uh, that kind of effort. Anyhow, we're really lucky to have Anna join us today as well. So first question, we're going to talk a little bit among ourselves at first, and then we want to open it up to your questions. So we hope that you'll be thinking of things you want us to talk about. And uh, the three of us are people who are really tell it like it is. So just like what worked, what did not work. I often find that what didn't work is as interesting as anything else. And what challenges we faced. And, uh, and look, the work of EDI in the corporate sector is far from over. There's so much more to do. So there's a, more humility than anything else that you're going to hear from us. But we are people that believe in taking action. And so you'll hear that from us. And then again, we want to connect with your questions. Um, so uh, my first question, and I'll, I'll answer it for myself and then I want each of you to answer it. The question is, you know, why do we care about being leaders in EDI? And so you heard from my biography that there was that moment I joined an investment firm as a two day temp and the I didn't know that that was going to become a career for me, but there were people and there was a culture that made me feel like I could dream 
to be in that place and that I could belong. And there were people that made that happen. They gave me access to the experiences that I needed. They, gave, they nudged me to take on new roles and to learn new things. So there were role models and sponsors of inclusion and belonging in that organization. And that was not straightforward for me because I was a music major in a finance firm and I was an out gay man in a firm that had no gay role models and no uh, very few senior like women role models. So it was not clear that I was going to fit in or belong or have an opportunity. And there were people who made that happen, gave me those opportunities. And so I want to pay it forward for others. Like I want other people to be able to find their dreams and do what they want to do and to be part of removing barriers that allow people to choose to be who they want to be and to grow and, and for cultures to be more open. So that, that's, that's my why uh, as to why I care about this. Uh, Anna, maybe you. Uh, I think for me, it's um, I am an immigrant myself, and I'm a child of immigrants, so my family immigrated to San Francisco when I was a baby. And really, part of their movement and leaving everything behind in Asia was to make a better life. And this concept of all is possible. So while I did not grow up, maybe if those of you that believe in those stereotypes of Asians, I, I did not grow up with tiger parents. I didn't grow up with parents that, that you know, wanted me or always said straight A's was the most important thing. And frankly, I didn't even grow up with parents. I'm probably one of the few people that don't even play a musical instrument. And again, if you believe in that stereotype. Yet I did grow up with this concept that the world is open to me and it was all is possible. And that is that American dream, if you want to call it that, and that ability to really reach whatever um, and access whatever we want, right? And, and clearing the pathway. So I was the first in my family to graduate from college and the first to even have any type of corporate role. And I think because of that ability to have done that, uh, living in a place where maybe there were barriers, but perhaps I was ignorant to those barriers and feeling like um, I was able to achieve that way more than what my parents ever had access to when they were in Asia and without an education, I feel it's actually a personal obligation for me to use this place of privilege. And I think everyone in this room is in a place of privilege to do that for others in whatever way we choose to, right? It, it doesn't have to be big actions, but any action is one where we can open a pathway for that next person to really reach whatever their dreams are. So it's really, I, I never really thought of this question of the why until Alan put it in those terms, but as I reflect on it, that's really how I feel as I show up in the workplace every day of how do I use that position uh, for the good of others. Um, so, so my answer is probably has something to do with uh, Golda Meir School in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is a third, fourth, and fifth grade elementary school and my parents. Uh, I grew up in Milwaukee. Uh, you can't tell by looking at me, but I'm half black and half Syrian. I was adopted at birth by white parents and have older sisters who are white and have a brother who was also adopted who's half Korean and half black. He was adopted from an orphanage in Seoul. Um, and we were raised in Milwaukee, was Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the 70s and 80s, which was a hyper and is a hyper segregated city. But the neighborhood that my parents chose to raise us in, which I realized later they helped build. It wasn't there when we got there. I thought it was just the neighborhood we moved into. It turns out that they and the, and the neighborhood constructed this very intentionally, was really, really diverse and accepting of all different types. So even though I grew up in a city where I was constantly aware of the fact that, that I was one of one, and I was reminded of that daily, um, I thought it was an advantage for some odd reason, as did my brother. And so my brother and I really, and we've talked about this many times, especially in the last two years during COVID, about how somehow our parents instilled in this, this belief that it was an advantage because we didn't have to be in, the, in part of any one group, we could be part of all groups. Now that wasn't actually true, but, but we, we, we approached <laughs> life that way. Um, and, and one of the things that, and I've, had a, I've thought a lot about this because of the, in the work that I do, this, story gets, this question gets asked a lot. And um, I trace it back to Golda Meir School because I remember vividly being on the playground when I was very young and I would find myself stepping in when people were starting to alienate people or be mean to people or put people in boxes. I, and, and, and candidly, as I thought about it more, it was probably 
a preventative measure myself because I knew if that went on too long, I was going to be put in one of those boxes or be alienated. And so I, but I tended to kind of, you know, get involved. I was playing kickball and somebody was mean to somebody near the jungle gym. I got involved. Um, so I've always had, some part of me has always been wired to be kind of um, animated about this. I think it's probably the stint in government where in particular uh, you find how important representation, which is one of the most basic things to think about, actually really does matter at scale. And you see the power of it on a day-to-day -day basis or the power of its absence on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that's probably where I got particularly motivated from a business perspective. And, and, a, and then at BlackRock, it was just the chance to be next to the, and work with some of the greatest researchers in the world who've been work, researching this for decades. And the, da the data is so dispositively clear that only in the human domain do we think homogeneity is like the right way to run things. Like, uh, and so I'm a believer in the research as well. For, so for all those reasons, you know, it eventually became my career to work in this space. Um, so thank you both for that. So l let's reflect. I, I definitely want to get to the stories where it's been challenging, but let, let's at least, let's start with something like something that you worked on that was meaningful and showed that there was progress in EDI with some group or organization. I just think it uh, and. What what was what did that look like? I mean, I'll, I'll I'll prime the pump by sharing one from BlackRock for me. So I mentioned that we founded the Out Network, the LGBT network. Like, it started as a fledgling thing. We thought it would be mostly the San Francisco office. It got bigger than that, and then BlackRock bought the company that we were part of. That we were Barclays Global Investors and BlackRock bought. So it was a corporate acquisition. We thought that might be the end of the LGBT network, or it, like it might be a risky thing. It turned out to be that in the women's network turned out to be net ways of people connecting during a corporate merger that like provided a sense of belonging and connection and confidence when there was a lot of change going on. And the biggest moment for me was like, so fast forward a few years, I visited the New York office of BlackRock and we had gone from people being closeted in New York to people having pictures of their partners and spouses on their desks. And it was just visible. Like you walked around the halls and you saw people's desks and you could see that their whole life was showing up in a different way than it had before. And you're like, oh wow, well, like this is, we're not where we need to be, but this is a heck of a lot better than it was, right? And you just like, and you knew that it was gonna go somewhere from that. So Share, share some things well, there. Well, so we, we had a lot of success at BlackRock um, while we were there together between late 2014 and 2020, basically shifting to a very diversity-focused conversation, and candidly, at the beginning, a very gender-focused conversation, with, uh, so very narrow, into a wider aperture of diversities, but in particular on the um, how we treat people once they arrive conversation, which is the equity, inclusion, belonging bit. And I'm, I'm, I was very proud of how much we shifted that conversation to try to do both things at once. But you know what really flashed to my mind was literally 30 days ago, I'm sitting in Northern California on a mountain where there are 14 sites for this nuclear energy company that will remain nameless. And we're doing a series of diversity, equity, inclusion events with their kind of senior leadership teams, including the people who run all 14 of those plants and the people who report directly to them. And if any of you had walked in with us, when we walked into the room with the 60 people who were gonna be there, you'd be like, this is not our crowd. This is gonna be an interesting conversation. Um, but I've, I've learned through lots of uh, mistakes to kind of uh, not, thanks, not um, to hold my expectations above the heads of the people in front of me and not have low expectations for them. Because it's unfair, I'm doing what, I'm, what I suggest people don't do. I'm prejudging people. But also people sometimes can reach up and be in a different place. Long story short, we were done with the session and uh, it went extremely well. They got very, very engaged on a whole bunch of things, but there was one guy I was watching the whole time who just was not paying attention, was not, it just, his body language was terrible, his arms were crossed the whole time, he was looking down, he was futzing with his phone. And, that, and it, 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 I just became trained on him. And at the end, he came up to me and he's like, this was not what I expected at all. You just helped me understand my son perfectly. And he had tears in his eyes and he walked out and I was like, Okay, one, that's a reminder of why I'm a jerk, because I'm sitting here judging the guy because of his body language, but two, <laughs> in this really tense time, all of us are judging each other too quickly because the fear of setting something off or having someone who's opposing us like engage is just really high, we're like highly tense. And we've gotta fight past that because you're underestimating people 
and there's more shared experience and we're more alike than unalike. And so that was just a reminder to me that you have to kind of, even when you walk into a room with people you're just not, you're sure just not gonna be down for this topic, uh, you have to adjust your expectations because people always surprise you. I find people surprise you more to the upside than the downside. There's, there's definitely multiple examples and um, both of the, uh, both Jonathan and Alan's example just prompted um, this thinking about names. There's a little bit of a, um, I, I don't know how much, how many people in this audience use LinkedIn. So if you do use LinkedIn, you know it's more of the platform, social media platform for business folks, right? Um, but if you go back five years ago, there would be a very small segment of people that even talk about their or reference their identity in uh, beyond, you know, just talking about business and I got this promotion or you know, posting. So, but if you actually track it, it actually has evolved quite a bit. And to me, that's a bit of this change that we are seeing. Uh, May was Heritage Month for Asians, so I was uh, fortunate enough to be selected as one of <clears throat> a handful of what they call creators that was asked to put specific developed content about um, EDI. So one of the articles I chose to write was about, um, f and this may come up in different communities, for the Asian community there's this discussion about us not being a monolith because the API community makes up you know, over 50 countries of origin and you know, immigrants, like, yep, for me personally, I really focused on the discussion about being a mosaic. And so I posted content about that, but I also wrote a specific article about what is in the name. And I talked about my birth name, which is of course, because I was born in Asia, it was an Anna, it was a Chinese name, and how my parents chose my name Anna, which was because the only name they could spell, because it only had two letters in it, A and N. And so I wrote this article about that and my own journey about that and tied to identity. And what I found quite rewarding was then the amount of comments that came back right through the comment session from, um, from different business people that talked about their own name journeys and their, some of them choosing to reclaim their birth names or their heritage names and others who chose not to and just the whys. And then I had dinner with a former board member of mine who's Korean American, and he was as a, grew up as a, assimilated as you can imagine. And he did everything in his early career to do that. And they even became a JAG, right? Entered the military, was an attorney, became a JAG, and did all that. And I just recently had dinner with him, and he referenced that um, article I wrote. And he's actually currently learning Korean at 60. I'm like, what's going on? And he goes, well, you know, it's all this stuff that I rejected. And he called me by my Chinese name because it was in the article. So I reflect on that little vignette and I said, that is what I see change, right? You have people in business who are publicly talking about their identities, sharing their stories, and then really at whatever stage in life, personalizing and thinking about what that means to them and in turn, when they do that and they are higher, I'll call self-actualized on our own identities, then we can show up as leaders to support others and create an environment that really is much more inclusive because we're able to have that conversation as simply about our names and why we either chose to or not chose to, right? Change it or take a new name and what it means to us. So something as simple as that, I think, is a reflection, Alan, to your question about what really has changed over the years and some of these impact of our collective work. Can I make one macro point, just I thought maybe yes. just from the business world perspective. So you all remember the 20, summer of 2016 when there was the Orlando nightclub shooting, there was a, a guy turned his car into a weapon in Nice, France, and there were black men and boys getting shot, it seemed like every week, and then a cop was shot during a protest in Dallas near the end of the summer, and you had corporate executives everywhere making all these statements, making all these commitments, and, and if you could have found five of them uh, after George Floyd's murder, who were, had, were still doing anything they had talked about four years earlier, I would give you a prize. Um, however, yeah. I think because of Me Too, COVID, George Floyd, 
Asian hate in that order. Um, the good news, it's not, there are still a whole bunch of people going back to the same playbook now that the lights have dimmed a bit. But there are a lot more who are seriously trying to make change th this time around. And our belief as a firm um, is because the locus of responsibility shifted from customers and the media to your employees. It moved inside the organization. And people are responding to their employees who are not leaving. They're not going anywhere. Their attention is not being distracted by other things. Or they're holding them accountable on the anniversaries and saying, have we done what we said we were going to do? So we're seeing a much higher percentage of companies doing a lot more. The reason why it's quiet is because when companies really try to change behaviors for a safety program or a product or manufacturing facility or whatever, it takes a while. Like they put systems in place, they put incentives in place, they train people, they hold them accountable. It takes years. And so the good news is, because corporate move, can move faster than most societal change, there are far more people who are more serious. It's not as many as anybody would like, but it's way more than it was four years ago, five, five and a half years ago. So maybe actually that's a, well, first of all, I want to reflect on the fact that when we were thinking about progress, you, you all heard us tell stories and heard us tell stories about things that like, on the one hand seems small, but on the other hand, you can see how it's, the, the trust and belonging have to be there for people to actually open up and start changing their behavior. And that, I think that's one of the reasons those yeah. stories come up because there's something about, and, and somebody has to go first It's uh, to make those things move. I also think when you're trying to, this stuff can get really big when you're trying to change the world and boil the ocean. And sometimes that can work against you. And I learned from a friend's father that sometimes you need to reach out and just make the person who's on, Hand, whose shoulder your hand is on and make their day a little bit better. Like you need to, sometimes you just need to shrink it down to the little things. I do think the little things add up to change human behavior and groups of people. But also just in order to stay motivated in this work, sometimes it's like you can't be responsible for the whole. Yeah. You need to shrink it down to be responsible for the people right in front of you. Yeah. I, I do think on that, you have to believe you can make a difference. Right? Right. If you don't believe that, then you won't make a difference. Um, and so that, that is the starting point of a, yeah. of a personal accountability. So we, we all acknowledge this works hard, yep. and it's uh, and as you said, Jonathan, it is an ocean of work. There's a lot that There's needs lot. to be better. Uh, talk about a time when you ran into a roadblock uh, of some kind, and what did you do to move past it? Uh, any anything that comes to mind of that nature around like being a leader in EDI. I, I think one of the challenges is always, right, as you do this work, and Alan knows Thank I'm a you. bit of a purist, an idealist, if you haven't heard that already from the way I reflect. Um, and I do struggle at times when people are supporting things, whether it's genuine or they're just trying to check a box, right? Whether they're doing it just to check a box, whether it's to look good, whether it's to get, you know, get the press off their back, et cetera. As I've processed all of that in these years of work, both internal to my organization and with the Sen, I've concluded that maybe I should worry less about the person's motivation, yeah. but know that regardless of their motivation, if I can take the organization of the person on the journey, they too will see the light and put my energy on that and worry less about what was their starting intention. And for me, once I was able to really shift that thinking a bit and then say, okay, I didn't care that that CEO mm -hmm. two years ago sent out a letter, but he sent out the letter. So I'm gonna hold that person accountable. Mm -hmm. I didn't care that they did it for a good year at that point in time, but that gave me the hook to go back and have that conversation of, well, what have you done? And, and really use that as a plus versus kind of saying, oh, well, those people aren't truly committed. And again, it was as much me accepting that, that that was okay and using that as a plus versus being so pure about well, what was that person's intention. And if they weren't with the same integrity and the same intention as mine, they must not be as serious about this journey. Uh, so before, I have lots of obstacles to talk about, but before, <laughs> I, actually it's really, I had, I've had the exact same experience. I went on the exact same journey and got to a point where, you know, um, I would sometimes just show a list of all these reasons why people care. And I'm like, I want to be clear, I don't care why you care, I just care that you care. 
Um, and some of those reasons are because, you know, it seems like I have to do it or my CEO says I have to do it or whatever the case may be. But one of the things that um, we saw as a behavior change when you're trying to get people who've been used to operating one way to do something that's unnatural, which is to do something different than what's worked so far for, to this date for them, is you know all the incentives we had put in place and everything else could never beat the fact that if we got someone to change their management style and someone on their team came up and said, you know what, people really like that you did that thing, you should keep doing it. Most humans are not gonna go back after that happens, right? Like most people, mm -hmm. once realizing that this is working better for the people around them, so whatever gets them started, yeah. like people say, this is a check the box exercise. I'm like, check the box and I'm gonna hold you accountable. Let's go, you know what I mean? Like I think that, so, so I think it's really important not to judge you know, people's level of belief or compliance or what, however you think about it. Um, I've had like, I've had uh, so many obstacles that I would say that you wanna build an ebb and flow into your process for your own psychology because you, you know, as you make progress, you also start to put pressure on people and organizations because it starts they start to be accountable and they start to see the change and and so that'll be there'll be periods in there where you are naturally going to get more pushback and the ones that are going to throw you off are the ones you didn't see coming from the person you thought was semi on your team or at best at worst neutral who stands up and says which i had happened to me at a very high level in the middle of the company with one of the people who was supposedly sponsoring the whole thing that you know white men are becoming endangered species around here in an organization that was probably 78% white men. Um, so the, I've seen the obstacles many times. The obstacle I'm most concerned about right now is actually overall burnout for everybody. We're seeing even the champions of these efforts just saying, I just, I just need a little bit of a break. Like I can't do the next new thing. I can't push the rock up the hill this morning because I wake up every morning and I see it and I'm there. But I just, the, the overall level of burnout for new stuff mm. is actually my greatest fear about uh, slowing down, but I keep reminding myself, maybe I just need to give some people some space for a while and let them slow down, because if you keep pushing them, it's not gonna work. But that's, that's the biggest obstacle I see right now. I'll, I'll share a story of my own, which is, um, so in the investment world, and like in the orchestra field, we talk a lot about these highly specialized orchestra musician roles and how tough it is to change representation there. And it's true in investments. The investment world is like people expect a certain background and a certain amount of experience. And uh, so as a leader of an investment team, like I face this question of like, how could I diversify the people that were work for me? And, and you know, especially when I, I, I promoted and uh, uh, advanced the careers of a lot of women in particular. And so we were really proud to get to like, the majority of the senior women on the index investments team at BlackRock were, are women, which is really, really cool. And, but I, what I will tell you on the way to getting there, when I started moving people around to give them new responsibilities and expanded their jobs, I, and people, I started getting phone calls from senior people saying, well, but this client really likes this guy who's no longer responsible for this, and you, you're, why are you upsetting the apple card, and I'm worried about my client, and I'm worried about what that looks like, and you know, you have to remind people of what we're trying to move toward, which is accelerating talent and moving toward a, a goal. And you have to say no time is perfect and you have to stand your ground. But it is, uh, and change requires that. It just requires people saying, I, I can't change everything at once. Like I can't sit here and tell you that all of the investment teams at BlackRock are equally diverse, they're not. Uh, we're making progress on that. But you can start where you are and start and, and, and have a plan and bet on talented people that change the game and then you have to have the courage to stick with it when the resistance comes because the, resistance is about change more than anything, it's uh, primarily. Anyhow, that, that's, so I think there's something in that, but I, you know, you. You, you could look at the demographics of things in a lot of, a lot of technical roles in a lot of industries and be discouraged, but I don't think that's the right answer. I think the right answer is push forward, be creative, claim success in pockets and celebrate that is to me the way to move forward. Um, now, a lot of people, one of the questions for us is, in a, in, 
because and you've all got experience with both nonprofit and for profit. You know, in a corporation, a CEO can make a statement, can push people from a pay and promotion point of view to like maybe yeah. to yeah. I mean behavior is behavior, more but so. they, but they but they're, they're, they they have more authority over sort of the direction of travel and probably more tools. And this group yeah. is dealing with multiple. Uh, bodies that have to get aligned on these things. So can you talk a little bit about influencing when it's multiple groups that sort of have to come to the table and how, how do you think about that? How do you think about make? I actually believe even in a nonprofit environment, which I think most of this audience works in, right, whether through your boards or through these organizations, that same commitment actually does work regardless of how we say it's different. I have seen in my own boards, starting at the board level, and the executive team level, if there is intentionality and there is clarity of what is that North Star, what are the goals, and you hold people accountable for that, it will happen really fast. I think one of the pathways in companies of how they drive any strategic initiative, including EDI, is to tie rewards to performance. Right, that is one of the pathways used in those commercial entities. And it is fascinating to see how quickly someone, right, when you tell them it is important that you have more diversity or you have X, and X percentage of your comp or your bonus or your raise is tied to that. Again, earlier in my career being a purist, I actually did not like that. I actually, you know, that still makes me very uncomfortable as a person, because I want the person to do the work because they believe, genuinely believe in it. But sometimes for some of the segments of our workforce, that is the, the both the stick and the hammer that is most important. So I do believe, right, processes and systems that can link the results to the behavior are effective. I have seen amazing progress by boards, nonprofit boards, where if they choose to make their board diverse, they will get there in very quick cycles. And in fact, it can happen more quickly in nonprofit than in the commercial world because of the way board terms work, for example, right, in, in public company boards. So I guess, Alan, I'm, I'm saying that yes, maybe it is different in corporate, but I do believe that actually in the nonprofit world, there could be pathways to even accelerate that because of the nature of what you have. But you do have to have that intentionality, and we do have to have clarity of what are the goals. But I think this big boil the ocean doesn't work for most organizations, right? Because every organization is a bit different. And every organization, every board, every executive team has to set a, a set of goals that is applicable to what you are trying to achieve and have that be something that actually is achievable, right? It can't be so idealistic that no one can feel what good looks like, and then being able to make steps towards the, towards even more. But you gotta be able to step it, uh, you know, show, show that progress. Yeah, for me, the best analog is, you know, five years of working in an administration and putting people in these, in these senior roles um, who are going in and running agencies of, you know, anywhere from 50 to hundreds of thousands of people, and they can't, change the compensation system, the feedback system is kind of broken, they can't, they can't fire anybody, and everybody there is gonna see five versions of them over a 40 year career, so they know they can wait them out. Right. So the only thing you have left is inspiration. Right. Because right? fear doesn't even work, because they'll just wait. And, um, and so you would see, it's really interesting, you'd see people come from all different yeah. sectors, and you'd see who really could lead. Right. Um, not by charging ahead, but whether what people were following them was the metric <laughs> when they ran out. But the point is, um, seeing how people inspired folks, they were, uh, the couple of things that they had is they had a point of view, they were very clear about what they wanted, but then they invited those people in to solve the problem of how to get there. They let them make business decisions over time about how they're gonna get someplace. And, and the way I see that play out in this work is a lot of times we're trying to fight this conversation higher by higher, for instance. You can't have it at that level. You need to have it at a level where over a five year period you're gonna hire many people and you all sit down and say, what do we want this to look like at the end? And then let's start making some decisions about how we're gonna get there. Um, so, that you're, so that you're making those decisions make, and allowing people who are gonna have to make these decisions into the solution, as opposed to just telling them, hey, you gotta go do this with this one hire. I just don't think that works 
if you want to inspire people at yeah, all. But here's the thing. If you're going to do that, this is what, another thing I learned the hard way. If you're incentivizing people on the upside, that's a really good thing. You know, giving people rewards. Um, your greatest reward by a leader, by, what, by the way, as a leader is usually not compensation. There's something called a leadership shadow, which is like what you do more than what you say casts a long shadow. So what you give your attention to, who you reward verbally, who you uh, kind of engage more fully and who you don't, the things you do more than the things you say have a much longer shadow than the words you leave behind. But what you also have to be prepared for is what happens when somebody visibly goes against this? What am I going to do? Because that's when people are going to really question. All right, let me see what happens here. If this person is renowned in their space, one of the top exes, a high producer in our former world, are you really going to hold their feet to the fire and maybe penalize them and maybe even potentially let them go? Are you really going to hold, when, when you might suffer a little bit, are you going to stand by your principles? And you need to prepare for that moment because it's going to come. And everybody's going to watch your reaction very quickly. And if you hesitate for even a little bit, they're going to think they're two sets of rules. And so you literally need to play that out in your mind. Now, how am I going to manage to the left side of the distribution, the people who are not, even when some of them is, are, are particularly valuable to us in one way or another? Because mm -hmm. it's going to happen. Yeah. And I think what you're hearing between the two of us, right? I don't, well, maybe on the surface it sounds like it's conflicting. But I think it is, it's not because we're saying these are all systems. Right, and every piece of that system and these processes actually have to be in sync around. Yeah. It's not the one thing, right? And it, it, it depends on the culture of your orchestra and the organization on which aspects mm -hmm. that are gonna work, right? And the nature and the size and scale also makes a difference, right? Tenure makes a difference. The, just the culture, so to speak, of the organization all make a difference in terms of driving the change. So one more, one more question for me and then I wanna open it up and we really wanna get your specific questions on problems that, and I've heard from a lot of you like things that you're, so think about this because I know people are dealing with boards who are not on behind you or your communities, some of your patrons are not there or you're worried about this or you're worried about, we really want to hear what those are and see if any of our experiences can help you. So we're, we're coming to that. Uh, our, uh, we gave an award to uh, Simon's predecessor, Jesse Rosen, yesterday, and one of the things he said in his acceptance speech was um, that we really need to listen to younger people in our lives, and if we want to be relevant to the future, another really inspiring session I attended during this conference was uh, uh, Ravita uh, talking about like the future, and we need to be futurists, and we need to think about the future, and we want our field to be relevant to the future. And so, can you talk a little bit about how, I mean, I, I know both of you believe powerfully in this, but can you just say a little bit about like why EDI matters so much about the future of anything, anything that you're, anything you care about? So, <laughs> I'll share it from two perspectives. One, um, Alan knows I have a 21 year old who just graduated from college. So I get to live the world through her in some ways, right? And what's important to her and her friends. She grew up in the Bay Area, went to college in the East Coast. So I see, right, how they interact. I see how global a perspective, and I see, frankly, what technology has allowed them to do. And, and many of her friends, while not her, uh, are actually trained classic musicians, yet they don't, their world is not so immersed in it as maybe the generation before, right? Because they want more than that. So that, that future, and their belief of voice and their strength going into, I'll say, the workforce, very different mm -hmm. than when I graduated from college, right? We very, very much a view that their voice should count. It doesn't matter that she has 30 years less experience than her boss or her new boss will be. And I do think when we think about it in the audiences, not only in the workplace, but in the audiences, and then you think about social media, right? So much. Think about how we, how we curate what is good now. It is not by, you know, by that, that one music critic. It is by what the public perceives is good. We might disagree with that. But there's enough people that say that, right? That is a heavier voice. So when I think about that, this generation of the future and what, how they decide, how they curate, how they pick how they spend their time and money, a completely different set of factors 
than myself, right, as a middle-aged female. And so I think if we don't respond to that, and I see that in the workplace. I see that in, when I put on my Deloitte hat, I see our younger folks, right? They want to innovate more. They don't want to have something so baked for them and they just go and execute and it's a person that does the, the execution of the work. They want to know that they actually help co-create. They want their name on it, in fact. Right? They want to be at that meeting. No longer is it, oh, you can't get to sit in a board meeting until you're this senior as a person. They can't wait 20 years before they get to that, right? They want it today. And I, I think all the statistics, all of the studies of demographics, all the studies of consumers show that. And if as organizations, we don't actually respond to that, we risk losing those individuals even faster. Coming into the room, we were talking about attrition in the workplace and in the workforce. And that's actually real, right? The turn of people in the workplace, even for companies that are long tenured, right, in terms of their culture, it, we can't hide from that. And I think that is reflection of what this future generation wants in their life experiences. They're not gonna be in I've been at my firm 30 plus years. Alan's the same. You've moved around a bit, but staying in a space. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to be my daughter's future at all. Right? She's going to pop around. She's going to go big company, small company, big, live in big cities, small cities. So the way they experience will be very different. And I, I don't think we're quite ready for that, actually. Our systems and our processes in society and workplace is set up actually for people to be in one place a little bit longer. Right, and, yeah. and to anchor a little bit more. But I think all of us will, will actually have a different mindset. So I think organizations need to be ahead of that quite a bit as we think about whether programs, whether relationships with our donors, right? they're, they're not gonna stay in San Francisco and be a, a donor to the orchestra or the symphony locally for decades because they're not gonna be living here yeah. for decades, right? Yeah, I would just say, just so I think this is a generationally. I think we've overstudied the millennial generation and have yeah. understudied Gen Z. Yeah. Uh, those two groups, however, make up you know sixty to seventy percent of most people's workforces these days, and they do have a different. They have a more aligned view on these topics, um, probably than most. But I would Gen Z would be the one I'd focus on just because one of the things that's really interesting about that group of people. Um, and you've seen this play out, they have, they have this really high conviction rate. Now they think we're all part of the problem. So they look at us and say, we cause the climate problem, we cause these race problems, we cause these community-based problems. Uh, and I just read a study that was done for um, a really big consumer products company on this generation. 78% of them are concerned about the future, but 83% are okay with it because they're gonna be the solution. Like, you don't normally see 78% of a population being concerned about something, but also convinced they can kind of solve it. That's a very unusual data set. But the other thing about them, and this is, I think, important from a consumer perspective, which is kind of how you have to think about this, is their conviction rates are very, very high. They put their money where their mouth is, which is a little bit different than probably my generation X and probably generation Y. They voted higher rates. They, they are the ones driving kind of cancel them, but more on a value ba values basis. And they literally believe that community identity comes from values. They think your values are how you organize. And so um, the US has already has birth rates that are majority mixed and has for years. Uh, it's a group of people that when you ask them about their friends and say, well, is your friend black or white? They're like, why do you even care? Why, why do you even ask? The point is uh, the consumer population that is much larger than their parent, their older brothers and sisters or parents is, is changing very, very quickly. Um, but in the sense is that they will be, they will vote with their dollars and their feet more than maybe gen any generation since the greatest generation that fought World War II, literally. So uh, who, who's got a question for these guys? Yeah, and pl if you could use the mic, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, so Is it on? Yeah, I'm a singer. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> you can project. So uh, I have a question about safeguarding failure for, for people that are coming into organizations that um, you know, that are mostly white. Um, I was watching Marin Alsup's documentary and she talks about that when you only given one opportunity, you can't fail. 
And so then you start to play it safe and not take risks. And we all know we need to take risks, especially in business, to move forward. But what are some, I guess, things you've seen that have worked that help um, make people feel like they can really fail and it's OK? Because um, I, you know, I grew up as a musician, now I'm an administrator. And that perfectionist you know, thing is really hard to shake. Um, and I feel like only in this decade of my life have I figured out the like, it's going to be fine if I fail. But I certainly didn't feel that you know, at entry level, at mid-level even, that I, that I could fail. And I kind of wish I could have um, trusted. Um, but yeah, I guess just what are some things you've seen in the corporate side that have been helpful for and employees? I'm so glad you brought up the Mir and Alsa uh, example. So she became the, she's out lesbian conductor of the of Baltimore Symphony, and the first few years were pretty tough around like being challenged by different constituencies in that ecosystem around her ability to succeed. So senior lead, senior diverse leader in a high profile. It's a great question because it happens everywhere, corporate, nonprofit, like. So what have you guys seen work to support people in those situations and I think set it, it up for success? Yeah, I think, well, first it starts before you hire the person. So language matters a lot. And you'll hear, well, I don't know if we can take a risk on this person. What exactly do you mean by that? Or um, people talking about somebody as a diversity candidate where they've reduced the person down to one variable. Um, so setting those conditions and being careful about the conversation up front and the team that you're going to build. This, the second thing, which is harder to do because it requires you to bunch your hiring, but if you look at what people have done at the academic level, the two and four year college level, there's an organization called Posse that's been one of the organizations that kind of cracked the code. They didn't match students from inner city Milwaukee or Chicago with my alma mater, Connecticut College. They matched eight students from the inner city in Chicago and Milwaukee and had them come in as a group. So there was kind of a peer group. You can do that with your existing employees. So giving people a support base and a safe space when they arrive. Being very intentional about their onboarding. Um, and you have to watch very carefully for people's conversations because people will take a first. And if they're not successful in a traditional sense, they will then say, see the experiment that failed. Whereas they would not evaluate the person who's part of a dominant group who's failed, and many have, in the same way. And so the upfront planning and thought about it, the building the conditions for the person to be successful, making sure that they have mentors and supporters who are maybe of their group, but also not of their group, uh, being very intentional in the early stages and helping them to be successful, and echoing um, and amplifying their successes in little small ways to, as they build momentum and sponsoring them. You have to do all of that. Because it really, unfortunately, that first person does have a lot, lot to carry. The last thing is, p women and people of color in the workplace get tapped to do a lot of things in the workplace that they don't get paid for, including talk about these issues and help to recruit other people and stuff like that. You need to try to help that person not do as many of those things in the first couple of years while they're, so do them for them, right? Especially if you're a member of a different group. Yeah, just just building on that, it's interesting. If for a period of time, if you were tracking women CEOs of big public companies, there was this pattern. They were getting appointed CEOs, but they were only, they were the ones that were like the last one. Right? These companies that they were becoming CEOs of had already been troubled for a while, crisis, yeah. like crisis. And so when they failed, it became a publicly, oh, well, it was a personal failure, but the companies they were picked to be involved with we're already on a pathway of very high likelihood of failure, right? And so and I when think- they succeeded, I think they got replaced by a white male. Exactly, when yeah. they succeeded, it wasn't the individual, yeah. it was the organization. And I think many of us feel that actually, right, in our work sometimes, right? That somehow for women and people of color, when it is success, it is because of others in the organization, but when it's failure, it's because I wasn't a good enough leader. So I think if you are responsible for your organization, you have to build an organization that actually is aware that those are the natural dynamics of how people look at success and failure and make sure you're not creating that, right? Why is, why is it if I actually did something that wasn't as perfect, that then is my defining moment, but my white male colleagues seem to have so much more latitude around that because if their client didn't do as well it was because the client was going through something not because they weren't as good a leader 
as me. And that is very deep in organizations in the psyche somehow, right? And so I think as leaders, we have to create that environment where we are saying no to that. We have to raise that question. Now we use a very clear example. So like many financial services in my industry, it's a heavy apprentice model traditionally. You know, we, there's a lot of recruiting. People come right out of college, probably very similar, right, to most of the symphonies. And then you work your way up and there's ladders, right? It's a ladder, it's a pyramid. And so our industry continues to, while we've done and made much progress, there's been this continued pattern of why is it when people then get promoted, one of the big milestones is when you can become an invited to the partnership, because these are large private companies in the big four. Why is it that then there were so fewer women and fewer diverse people? For a while, the conversation, and it still is, is, well, you know, there's less qualified people. I've been calling time out to the employers. I said, time out. Did you not, do we not all have big recruiting machines? And did we not require, uh, hire the best when you started this 10, 15 years ago? Who owned the success? If it was a diverse pool, why did you not track the scene a decade and a half later on the advancement of those individuals? And who owned that? Did you not train us? Did you not give us the right assignments? Did you not give us the platform? Was it all the individual? And why is it then, if it, even if it is an individual, why did you have a segment of the workforce perform less well than another segment? And who owns that? So I think there is this discussion, and if your organization has a similar pattern, then you have to ask who owned that, especially if it's a tenured, long-term career pathway model, and it cannot be all the individual. Right. right. The individual actually trusted the organization to develop them at the same pace as someone that didn't look like them. So why did a segment of the, the pool actually perform differently. I think companies are getting a bit more sophisticated on understanding that and looking at it so it's not that one thing, right? That one failure, that one assignment, that one performance, and really um, challenging the, the systems. And that is why, back to the earlier comment John, Jonathan made about, you know, you don't always see these actions because these are embedded in large process systems on evaluation processes, how people are perceived, you know, what roles they're given uh, in companies, and each of them build on each other, so. I, I know we're getting close to time. Could we maybe get one more question from someone? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to Jonathan's comments on people who oppose your work. And when you have someone who is very publicly and adamantly opposing the work, for instance, your union steward, and they point to the contract and say, there's nothing you can do to me. How, how do you deal with that dynamic? So I want to make sure I heard you. You're talking about union, well, union or board? So, so board. it's a member of the orchestra who's also our union steward. And when we have anti-racism training and people say, what happens if I make a mistake? Right? They're legitimately a little scared. What happens yeah. if I make a mistake? Before the trainer could even answer, she pulled out the clause in the contract and said, there's nothing they can do to you if you say something racist. Like that's the level of opposition mm -hmm. that she brings to the table. Yeah. So it's funny. We're, I was ju we were just having this conversation with the CEO two days ago because they were going to be in front of a bunch of people and they thought someone might have a very counter view as what do they do in that instance. And then the CEO was like, well, should I make my argument very swiftly? Should I? And we said, no. You should stop and say, well, tell me more about that and like actually engage the person in front of everyone. Um, the reason why is because um, in a group of people, and this isn't just, and I'm gonna take this outside of a union contract because that's kind of a little bit binding, but this is gonna happen in many different forms in many different ways. When somebody takes you on in a room and opposes your view, there are other people who agree with that person. And up until that point, probably if you have any conversation like this, they were half listening, but now they're listening very, very carefully to what you say next. So it's actually <laughs> an opportunity to influence people who otherwise probably weren't listening. But also you cannot become what you beheld. It's like First Amendment rights, which aren't about me speaking what I want to speak. I have to respect her ability to have, her choice to have a different point of view yeah. and her ability as long as we're having an adult conversation to espouse that view. And so the f first reflexive thing to do if you're in this situation is to engage a person and actually try to understand their position. 
um, we were preparing for somebody that was going to say something about a specific community because they this person tends to do that in public forums in front of the CEO and we were going to talk and so we gave him a series of questions to ask and then we talked about kind of what because that person's probably coming some from some place of fear or concern of their own and acknowledging that but then also understand how if they're going to manage and lead other people if somebody was a member of that group and heard you say that how would they feel about whether you're going to give them a fair shot so try to turn it into a conversation however you have to eventually say you don't agree and that is i think one of the things that we talked a little bit about beforehand that i would just say in in a heightened world such as the one we're in now where the stakes are higher and people are more vocal on all sides of these issues it's actually a time for greater authenticity and consistency so you have to prepare yourself that people are going to disagree with you and you're going to have to disagree with them in public sometimes and it, so it means that not everybody's going to like what you have to say but there's a funny thing that goes in the psychology of voters and consumers and everything else when you stand your ground the people who are with you are more with you they're more loyal and when you stand your ground consistently some of the people who aren't with you respect you more yeah. and candidly that's the path forward so you one the other thing or sorry the other thing i would just say and this is going to sound really sophomoric but it literally is helpful is um and alan's probably heard this before back in the old days but you know when uh when a professional athlete maybe even performers, I don't know, I'm not a performer, I was more of an athlete, but the, um, the night before a, a competition, they visualize the competition in advance. They think about the things that are happening. What they're doing is they're building muscle memory for something they actually haven't done because they want to react faster. These things happen very fast. And so my former boss at BlackRock and I used to, when we would read something in the paper, we would call each other and give ourselves like eight to 10 minutes to figure out what we would do over and over and over again if it had been our employee just to practice. So as a leader and a manager, if these things are likely to happen, you actually want to sit ahead of time and say, okay, if somebody says something like this, what are the different ways I can approach this? When you hear from somebody else, something happens, take that same approach. If you have a leadership team and it's gonna to happen to you as a group, literally, which we've done with leadership teams, put them through the same exercise. Give them 10 minutes to decide, should we say something, what would we say, who would say it, and when would we say it? And you'll see that it takes a little while to build the muscle memory, but those are just a handful of suggestions. Thanks very much. Um, I know I'm, I can tell from Karen that we're at time, but uh, uh, thank you for your attention and please join me in uh, thanking uh, Jonathan and Anna for their uh, participation in our session and um, we hope that this uh, was helpful. Our intent is really to empower you as leaders of change in EDI and we know it's not easy and we know there's a sense of urgency. And we also know that change doesn't happen instantaneously. So as much as we want it to be a sprint, it's really a marathon. And we, and we have to do it together, back to forward together. Uh, that's the only way that we're really going to, to make the change that we want to see. So thank you. Please join me in thanking Jonathan. And thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists and wonderful <coughs> questions from the audience. The good news is um, I actually got the timing wrong and we have another 15 minutes. Oh, right. oh, <laughs> um, so I hope that's good news to everyone because the, the quality of the questions coming from the audience was fantastic. So I'd love to encourage people to stay for another few minutes and uh, continue the conversation if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah. it's fine with us. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so another question. Is there another question? <laughs> Anybody? Yes. This gentleman and then you, Aaron, please. Okay, go. So good morning. Um, thank you for the, the amazing conversation. I think my question is really around um, systems change and how to try to drive systems change uh, partnering with corporations. And I know in this conversation we talked about two years ago there were corporations all across the world that were making um, statements around uh, DEI and, and what they were, the actionable steps that folks were going to take. Um, so I'm, my organization right now is in the process of uh, building out uh, a cross-sectoral group, really with, with an emphasis as an eight-year initiative to try and drive both diversity increase diversity and increase wages uh, mm -hmm. in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and making sure those two things are moving in tandem. So my question for you is, um, as we're, think we're assembling a cross-sectoral group, 
thinking about criteria um, for corporate partners, what would you, you know, the, the vision of this uh, initiative is really to drive 10,000 youth and adults from underrepresented communities into the LA uh, creative economy uh, with the understanding that our LA creative economy is not diverse. Uh, about three-fifths of the arts nonprofit field self-identifies as white. Wages, entry-level wages uh, for arts nonprofits are about $43,000 um, per year currently. $33,000 if you're BIPOC. Think about those numbers um, in, in a city that is struggling with the affordability housing issue. Uh, it's, it's really pushing. Uh, making it impossible for folks who are of diverse background or of low income background or you know various backgrounds to try and enter the field and stay in the field yeah so just thinking about criteria for corporate partnership around this issue i have a strong view on this one which is uh just because it was uh you know one of the things that you learn really quickly at a white house is that the fastest thing you can do is convene people and get them to do the work um, and so I think for when you're going across sectors like that, I think it's important to do a couple of things. The first is you're going to want to map what are the different pathways up the mountain that we could have, and then have we thought about every single stage and what we can do to mitigate those pinch points, right, that people, where people fall off, right? In a traditional recruiting cycle, for instance, people do a lot of work, and it tends to fall off at the decision level. So they'll get more diverse people in a pool, they'll have a slate requirement, they'll interview more people, they'll have diverse panels, and then people won't hire. So you have a similar you know, kind of pipeline that you're gonna to try to create. Understand that pipeline, and then I would, my strong recommendation was whatever you can do up front to understand that pipeline and articulate it and have data around it so that there's no debate about that. Because when you get multi-sectors together, they all look at it from their view and they debate the thing that's a problem for them. And they're all talking about separate things. It's really hard to get them. So getting a foundation of here's our theory of change and, and let's like agree on the data or what the issues are and try to get that out of the way. And then the second thing is, the other thing that's very hard because people come at this differently is to grant what the outcome metrics are. So I would make that a first part of the conversation. And candidly, getting more people to agree to fewer metrics is the better way to go. Like you, like you can't, you can start smaller and you can collect data and add more metrics l later. But if you can get a whole bunch of people who look at things differently to just agree on one or two things in common, now you have like a shared direction and a shared belief of, the, of like how you're gonna approach this. And then you can start all the other stuff that you already would have thought of. But grounding in like some shared sense of the problem we're trying to solve and what one or two things we're all gonna say is a success is, it sounds really easy, it's hard, but you need to do that heavy okay. lifting up front to make your work efficient and actually get everybody aligned. Because they're not always gonna agree, but they have to decide periodically together and keep moving. Yeah. And I, I wasn't clear from your organizational construct when you say corporate partners, what that means. I'm assuming you mean companies that either sign on or want to give you money to do the work, is that correct? No, we're really talking about corporate um, steering committee members. So we're establishing a round table of cross-sectoral leadership. So it's not just a sponsorship investment of the overall initiative, it's really actually bringing a partner to the, to the decision-making table so that they can help uh, agree on you know what the metrics are for for this overall initiative and, and help us actually drive the implementation of this so work. ultimately they you're trying to say the company is going to own whatever the outcome is right that that's, exactly so then I definitely would say what John, like echo what Jonathan would say right I think in some ways you do have to keep it simple mm -hmm. uh, and part of it is because companies also change leaders all the time so it has to be something that as whoever's on your council now, three years from now may not even be with that organization. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be at a place where it's visible enough within the company, it's institutionalized, there's this long-term commitment. So I'd make sure you get that mm -hmm. because it should not be tied to just that individual that happens to sit on your council. And I see that quite often, right? I see that in a and maybe some of you see that, right? If someone changes and if we didn't have a deep enough organization, somehow their commitment, is not the same. So you want to, if you have a very long view of eight plus years, you want to make sure that you are thinking through that. 
um, and it's not so about helpful. an individual passion. And, and, and then coupled with the metrics uh, approach that Jonathan said. And the, and the other thing I would say, just to add it, just you know, thinking about their interests, and they may have different interests, but I'm going to make a couple of assumptions, which is it, the more you can do also to find ways throughout the engagement of the project and the effort to give them um, things that they can then use to communicate internally to their employees or their external constituencies early signs of progress, ideally with human stories behind them. Like you'd be surprised how much those things work, in, especially in corporate settings. But remember, and you, you want to find this out over time, but they probably, again, like most people, have these internal constituencies as well as external. And the more they can talk earlier about the things they're doing that make those people think they've chosen the right place to work, that's a real return for them. And so that's a, that's a part of the equities that has, again, shifted a little bit. So the more you can make yourselves available, stories available, the people available, whatever, uh, and earlier, the better. Thank you. Thanks for Thank the question. You. First, I just want to thank you all on the panel for uh, being here today, especially this early, and making the commitment <laughs> to share your experiences, which are incredibly valuable to us. Um, my question comment is a bit uh, complicated. I guess the core is I wanted to hear your comments on transforming traditions um, as it relates from the for-profit and non-profit from your vantage point, understanding that the value propositions are completely different. Uh, mm -hmm. For profit, uh, the driver, one might say, is uh, revenue generation and profit. Uh, in the not profit, in, especially in terms of orchestras, it's a, a more vague term of excellence. And uh, our customer base is completely different. You mentioned uh, you know, Gen Z, 9 to 24 year olds, that's great. But for our industry, that's not the audience. In terms of donor base, it's generally Gen Z and bo boomers too, second group of boomers and our, uh, our structures in terms of the major diversity challenge for our industry, which is on stage diversity, uh, is challenging because it's not transitory. You get a job in the LA field, you're not leaving um, for 20, 30 years, typically. And so the structures are much less fluid. And so I'm curious, as we think about transforming tra traditions, tradition is a good thing, it, it provides cultural currency and confidence. But the traditions in our industry are based on, again, vague concepts of meritocracy, which I always laugh at because orchestra musicians do not re-audition every year. It's not like the NBA or the NFL where you have to prove your merits regularly. It does not happen. Yet we use that term as a shield for change. So I'm curious, given those differences, how you would respond around transforming tradition. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I didn't realize, I guess, that there was less mobility between the musicians over time because orchestra leaders, right, tend to, the conductors tend to move around, right, between, they don't stay in one place for 40 years. Well, they day. do a different thing than in for-profit. They actually uh, freelance. So I may have a contract, instead of George Zell, who was there for generally 40 weeks out of the 52, now you have most main conductors less than 20 weeks 15 weeks mm -hmm. in their home orchestra and their guests conducting all over the place. So they're allowed to be transitory and musicians are not. But isn't, I guess, a question I would turn back, I mean, with the changing demographics, and those are true demographics, unless you tell me that musicians actually are completely different in that mindset, the fact that it is a 40-year career in one place in one role, that in itself seems like it would be a come-up barrier to attract people into the, I'll use the word profession, right? Is that what you are seeing currently? Well, um, and I'm gonna amend my previous comment in terms of transitoriness, because musicians who are at uh, per service orchestras certainly are driving for dollars, as we like to say, but in terms of the major orchestras, once you land that plum job in the top five, top 10, you're not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. Um, or at least the incentives are, and the expectation in the culture is you're done. And so, um, but to, to your question, uh, change, I'm sorry, I missed, uh, forgotten your last comment. Just about, isn't it a barrier then, the fact that there's this expectation that you stay in one place oh, yes. for so long? For well, just even attracting people into deciding this is a career journey or path for them. Yes, so there is competition from other, just inside the music sector. Right. That would say, gee, why don't you come 
to Los Angeles and play on TV shows and movies and do things that would allow you a bit more flexibility. So we lose some of our talent to that. But um, if you've studied uh, orchestral instruments since the age of five or 10 and you're going through that whole system, by the time you're 23 and you're graduating out of your graduate school, conservatory, or what have you, you're on a track. And that track is very, uh, has strong appeal to follow this model. And then you land your job and there's very little freedom. As a, was it, 1990 study said that orchestra musicians' job satisfaction ranked just a little bit above prison guards in terms of freedom <laughs> in their job. So when you describe your daughter and yes. her desire to have control, that ain't happening in orchestra. <laughs> um, Which is probably why none of her friends that studied while they didn't go to the conservatory and one of her best friends actually is a very accomplished museum and actually potentially was thinking of going to NYU for music and chose not to in that generation, right? And, and, and so... But, but you're, you're at the same time, you're right. There are many musicians. Uh, I teach at the Juilliard School, so I see a lot of them go right into major orchestras, but they're coming in already understanding their brand. So the Gen Zs are not only perform yeah. performing, they're creating Instagram brands, they're starting separate side businesses that give them the freedom and fulfillment. But in terms of transforming the traditions of the industry so that it welcomes more diversity, yeah. as my colleague mentioned earlier, uh, we hold on to things like, well, the CBA, and gee, will this diversity hurt our excellence? Mm -hmm. These are the racist tropes yes. that uh, persist in our field. So I'm curious your reactions looking from the for-profit side and the public you know, governmental sector side, uh, how to transform these traditions. Um, and in, any thoughts on that? Well, first I think you have to, you just mentioned one, right? You have to call it. People have to understand that those are barriers and a lot of work is done around that. Companies are doing, as an example, a lot of work around whether it's practices, language, well, that was talked about earlier is very important. So I think one, you gotta get to a agreement that those are some of these just subtle barriers uh, first, and then accept that. And then driving this transformation, it's true in corporate, the markets determine, right? If we don't adapt, we're not gonna be able to get the best people into big corporates. And that's actually one of the dynamics now. Do, do the younger workforce, they wanna go to startup, more entrepreneur organizations, or they wanna go to companies like BlackRock and Deloitte, where we do have very still, right, more structured apprentice model pathways. And so what you see in our organizations is we're trying to have alternatives. It's not one model of advancement. It's multiple models. It's a more customized depending on what is going on in the person. I, and I, I guess I would ask, you know, in the orchestra world, can you not offer alternatives? Why does it have to be one model? So I, I, I hate to cut this off, but Jonathan, I want to get you in there and then we need to, we need to wrap. Oh, so just really a couple of quick things, um, which are going to seem a little bit contradictory, and I'll try to make them not. Which is, uh, the first is, you know, when you're changing tradition, or I think of the culture, habit, over time, you can't come in perpendicular. You have to kind of like work within it and usually mm -hmm. co-opt the language and then start to evolve it a little bit. Right, I'll give you an example really quickly from BlackRock. We used to always say it, we want to be one BlackRock, right? which is like about being a, one big organization, but kind of making it easy for the customer to kind of see us as one person they interact with. We started cha talking that about that as being, but we also recognize that there are 16,000 ones who work here and we celebrate them too, right? So we take the first part, which everybody uses all the time, right? Another, but another example is if people are set on meritocracy, which is a fallacy in the human domain because we have so many biases. So, but if, but if somebody's set on meritocracy, which the corporate world uses all the time, you have to say, okay, well, in order for this to be meritocratic, here are the four papers that explain how you de-bias the system. Let's go make it meritocratic. So if everybody wants to, be, wants to talk about a meritocracy, great. Let's do the, the system that people who spent their life studying this actually say translates to a meritocracy. And that will, that will de-bias your processes quite a, quite a bit. So operating within the system, co-opting the language and kind of using it. But the last thing is you have to, at some point, because it takes a long time, you have to be honest about how long it's going to take. But you, you also have to make, decide for yourself that you have, if you want to own the reason why you're doing this, you have, and then you have to persist. And you have to persist for quite some time. 
because it does take it does take a long time for all the reasons you're talking about your ability to change the people on the stage is going to be slow and so there's a certain amount of persistence that you have to have which is why you have to kind of state your purpose build a system ideally that gets you there and then just stick with it yeah i think this intention and the belief that the future will be different right if if your constituents believe the future is going to be exactly like it is today then there is no motivation to change right so Thank you. Well, thank again, you. Thank you for the question. Thank you for your engagement, and uh, let's operate with that persistence. Thank you. Thank you.